Make the speed. It worked. All right, how are you doing? Okay. Nice. Sort of, and you? Doing well. Good. Um, I could, at, um, I don't, are you, you're an hour difference probably. Right, yeah, because um, we don't have daylight savings in Arizona. You do, yeah, you have daylight every day. Yeah. Um, but anyway, an hour ago, what it, wherever, you know, um, the American Museum of Natural History in New York City mm -hmm. has um, had a, a Zoom conference that I could not connect to. But, um, but once a week to once a month, they have an astronomy um, session. It's relatively simplistic, but it's um, it still is good for me. Yeah. And it might, um, you know, if you're if one of your focuses is, is teaching astronomy, mm -hmm. then um, you could see how they teach and you know utilize their their stuff. I don't know, but anyway, I couldn't connect. I and see. Who knows? <clears throat> yeah. But you can see it on a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Do we have hey. the steward? Yeah, hi. Stuart. Hi. hi. Deb, hi. <clears throat> Ryan. Hi. Hi. Um, Deborah, I got your email a few days ago about um, fusion. The, uh, fusion, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's good to know. And that makes sense that um, fusion can occur here on earth, but for an extremely brief period of time as a result of fission. So yeah, yeah. really interesting article. What I remember hearing when I was a kid and we had air raid uh, drills, you know, I don't, you, I don't know that you went through it. We used to hide under our desk in school, like that's gonna make a difference. But what, was said now, so I didn't look any further into it. 
but uh, but that radiation was not a big uh, complication of the hydrogen bomb. It was the um, thermonuclear uh, the the force and the heat. Oh yeah, right. Just the the shrapnel okay. and the um, right infrared heat radiation that you know kills instantly. Yeah. The fallout is sort of just like the side effect that um, lingers on and that um, nobody really wants to be a part of either way. Right. Right. You don't need that strum strontium and the plutonium in your. Exactly. In, yeah. You, you didn't send that to me, did you? Yeah. I don't think so, because it came out of a conversation. Oh, after a. I left yeah, it was it was originally sent to Sam, and then Sam uh, forwarded it to me. Uh, yeah, because I didn't have your email address, but now I do. Right. Because I saw it on Sam's. Yeah. Mm. Don't worry, I won't pester you. Sounds <laughs> good. So, um, go ahead and share my screen. Uh, we'll find a piece of paper. Go. 2001 Space Odyssey. And this movie is a few decades old now, came out in 1969. And usually for my PowerPoint, I put like the, uh, the movie poster, but I was looking through Google images of all the, the Space Odyssey posters and they didn't really um, fit the screen. So what I did is I just input my own image. I took this photo about a month ago here in Tucson, and this is just the full moon rising above uh, the small mountain range. So this is what Arizona looks like. This is where I'm at right now. Is there any green? Um, very little. The only green I think you see are cacti and they're sort of dotting the landscape in the background <clears throat> very dry and uh, sandy mostly so this was way in the future when we first saw it right Stuart yeah before the, before land the first landing on the moon yeah it was uh, uh, surreal in a way at the time mm -hmm. just as it was so much in the past now exactly yeah <clears throat> the first uh clip oh looks like my screen share was paused for a second i'm just trying to plug in my phone um simultaneously let me just make it's sure this. i have this uh, it's not coming up. Anyway, um, first thing I wanted to look at was um, the very beginning of the film. Yeah. The ancient primates um, coming upon the the monolith that lands, and they discover it, and they kind of use it to their advantage. So. I guess when they first were living, another um, group of species were, was like attacking them. And then over time, over a really long period of time, they learned to develop tools. And like you see this guy, he's got a bone in his hand and they're able to make like a counterattack of the other animals that um, had ambushed them in the first place. And so the question I had was how long does it take evolution to play its course in just typical animals, for instance? Um, so there aren't really any physical characteristics that are being altered or changed in this scenario, but the primates are sort of developing a new way of doing things and that it becomes widespread and it's really dramatic. And I did some research to see how much time is required for some lasting widespread change 
to happen. And it turns out it's around about a million years. It's about a million years for you to see any um, conspicuous shift in an organism's uh, makeup and characteristics. And so it's a really, really, really long time. And I don't think the movie had portrayed it to be on that time scale. So I wanted to find a clip here. I have it saved on my phone. I'm gonna go try to hunt it down real quick. So I ended up doing the same thing where I just recorded the screen. <clears throat> For some reason it's not letting me, uh... oh, I may have to unlock it, that's why, there it is, okay. So I'll go on a camera and I'll share this window now. Okay, here we go. And Owen is joining us now. Hi. So I'm gonna share this one. Okay, so here are the, the primates. Hi. Hello, man. Hi. Hi, Deb. Hi. What's your first uh, name? Hi. Hi. My Who's first Ryan? name? Ryan. 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 Yes. Ryan. Ryan on St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Except Mr. Lett. I find it pretty impressive that even in the 60s, they were able to get pretty real looking apes, monkeys, I'm not sure what you call them, but they kind of like illustrate how they've been able to fight back against the other animals that had come after them in the first place. They're more great, uh, great ape sort. Are these guys more. humans that are costumed? Yes. I would think so, yeah. Yeah. It's impressive. Something's no. never changed. <laughs> No, we've kind of stopped evolving after this. Yeah. Um, so the really interesting takeaway is how slow evolution really is. Let's go back to sharing this now. Um, and there's a really cool video I wanted to share that sort of illustrates how drawn out the process is for you know, these primitive primates to evolve into homo sapiens, which are us. And I think we started roaming the earth, you know, maybe 100,000 years ago. 200,000. 200,000 years ago? Okay, so on that, on that order, yeah. Um, and, it's, and it's a little blurry um, to define, okay, when did like Neanderthal, Homo erectus, sort of fade away and then we're only left with homo sapiens um and it's hard to do because you're you really only have archaeology and carbon dating at um <clears throat> at your disposal for your resources but given that we can still develop or we can still write a timeline of how humans got from you know smacking rocks together to traveling through space. And this video I wanna share with you 
shows you just how um, how long it takes, really. Let me find this video now. Downloads. Okay. Hey, Aesop's Michael here. This. We're only seeing you. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna share the screen. Okay, just me. as long as you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just thinking. Yeah. I saw Lucy last two years ago. Oh wow. Okay. This year's protective ozone layer toxin. Even what crimes by juveniles in the penal conviction was worse. 0.55% of human history. And roughly speaking, yours will too. To put that in perspective, let's time travel starting right now. We begin 100,000 years ago, the beginning of modern humans. We are moving forward in time an entire millennia, a thousand years every second. As you can see, not much is changing. Our modern world will briefly flash at the end. That's all it is. That's all it's been. So be careful not to miss it. So I'll just reiterate what he says. It's You definitely make sure not to blink towards the very end. So we'll start where he plays the clips. Every second that passes by in the following clip represents 1,000 years. So just take that into consideration and watch how humanity unfolds. Not much is changing. Our modern world will briefly flash at the end. That's all it is. That's all it's been. So be careful not to miss it. And as always, thanks for watching. That was it. Our lifetime was just, you know, less than a tenth of a second there at the very end. And so, yeah, humans have been living pretty much in caves and uh, foraging for really several millennia. And then all you see, like modern history, you know, written history lasts for less than a second in that clip, where each second represents 1,000 years. What's interesting about that is that it doesn't feel like we're standing quite as still right now. It feels like the changes are changing faster than a thousand years per second. That's right, yeah. You know, it, that's the way it feels to me as a 68 year old um, person having gone through this last, you know, five to seven decades. For sure. And I think it has a lot to do with how connected we are and how quickly we can go across the world. You think about um, cavemen, even early humans, even people living in the Renaissance, they hardly traveled 50 miles outside of their birthplace. Mm -hmm. And they must be from even, Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And you think today, like you could travel 50 miles in one day and no problem. Like that's pretty typical for a lot of people. Yeah. I'm just reading um, about Lucy and she was later on 
from uh, Dr. Leakey's discoveries in the Rift Valley, uh, but she was 3.2 million years old. Oh, wow. Okay. So, hmm. that's so, crazy. You know, so it, it took a lot of evolution to get to be Lucy because by she's found in uh, Ethiopia. Um, so you had to get up from the Rift Valley. You had to get up from your haunches and walk. You had to you know, forage and uh, and use tools and stuff. So at 3.2 million years old, um, you know, there's a bunch of millions before her. Right. And it sort of brings up the still kind of contentious uh, thing going on. It's like, where did humans come from? Were we all from the same common ancestor in the continent of Africa? Or did we sort of come from a variety of different places around the world? And yeah, even- What's that quote? Convergent, you, you don't really, I don't think there's a thought that there's, con, what's the phrase? Convergent evolution, you know, de yeah. novo, you know. I've heard multi-regional as the term from all over. And yeah, it's, it's really hard to pin down. Um, we're extremely uncertain about those kinds of things. And also, you think back even 5 million years ago, which is a ridiculous amount of time, continents hadn't even shifted that much. You would need to go back hundreds of million years for you to see like um, dramatic no. Continental No, you could see at 60, 55 million years was when India was coming, was heading north and creating the Himalayas. So it's not hundreds. It, mm. It's, yeah. Yeah, because I think within the span of the dinosaurs from 250 million to 50 million years ago, part of the 160, yeah. What? Mm -hmm. a different time but they, they were when the when the uh, when africa and south america were conjoined yeah so that's part of how they got spread out all yeah. over everywhere because they they were on continents and then separated oh dinosaurs yeah 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 that is right yeah i think i just had my figures a little wrong i think i was looking at like major shift for like um, continents were in completely different places, but um, Deborah is right. Less than a hundred million years ago, India was separated from Eurasia. And when did Pangaea exist? How? Two hundred fifty yeah. million. That's yeah. right. Yeah, I'm looking at it dinosaurs now. Dinosaurs started yeah. evolving. Yeah, two twenty-five million years ago is when Pangaea first started fracturing. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, there's another analogy, which is in terms of how little, how short uh, civilized life is. They, they use this clock, you know, and say if it's 24 hours is all of, of life, of evolution mm -hmm. on the planet, what do you take the last 5,000 years? And it might be like, I don't know, it's like one second or five one seconds. Second, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. But, you know, it's interesting because in the 200,000 years of Homo sapiens, there hasn't been certain kind of changes, but there's a big bang that's uh, considered in within um, the anthropology and the development of humans. And that's when we started talking and communicating with each other with words, which is- Oh, yeah. So I'm some, you know, and whether I think there were changes maybe, I think there was a thought there was changes also in the vocal cords or something around that time that allowed that to happen. That was part of that whole process of that happening. Yeah, I, I think I just read a passage very much like that in a book I'm reading called um, The Mother Tongue. And it's mm -hmm. about English and how it evolved. And because like humans started walking upright and like grew a chin and a neck, we were able to like, um, house a larynx and actually articulate sounds rather than just making grunts like if your head is like 
mm -hmm. attach to your chest like this. Hmm. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but we, we had a sacrifice a little bit. So, you know, we don't have sharp teeth or long claws or any kind of speed, but we do have the ability to like um, ask questions and imagine and cooperate really in sophisticated manner. And that was sort of the trade offs like, okay, we're throwing away our physical defenses and we're growing some intellectual defenses. And it looks like we have a new guest, Lindsay. Welcome. So we're just talking about um, evolution here and coming from 2001, A Space Odyssey and the beginning of the film where we have these primitive um, primates. But the next thing I wanted to move on to- Oh, uh, one last little- Go ahead, yeah. Mm -hmm. I read an article in Scientific American about five years ago that basically said that the, it was two advances that allowed us as a species to basically wipe out Neanderthals and, and, and what a, the, two, the two advances were the ability to, uh, and the concept of being able to throw a projectile, projectile weapon. So, and so you didn't have to fight what Neanderthals did right there and lose a lot of people. And then the ability to have a, a large group. Oh, right, yeah. And, in, you know, five, 10, 15, have a strategy with 50 people. And just those two things were the jump that allowed because Neanderthals never really got to anywhere near that kind of size and groups. Right, exactly, yeah. Just the strategy, like you mentioned, is it was huge when just trying to um, get food, for instance, like um, hunting down an antelope. And another great asset we have is we're bipedal and we can sweat. And so we're able to do very long distance runs where an antelope is going to get heat exhausted over a period of time humans can run for hours and hours before um, needing to take prolonged rest. And that was like, you know, persistence hunting. Right. You know, my understanding is going back to that evolution of uh, the um, gorillas or apes or whatever in that scene, I thought, and maybe interpretation is different by you or the consensus, but by mm -hmm. touching the obelisk, that they got something from the obelisk that allowed them, at least the idea was to make that change very, very rapidly. Yeah, that is the and impression that I got. It was a little bit unclear to me when I first watched it, um, but I did some looking into it and that does seem to be um, the take that the, the monolith had something to do with um, they're making like, that jump. Yeah, that, that jump, exactly. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I, I thought about that, but then I left thinking they recognize this as something very different from everything else they've seen. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. just that. Um, because it uh, Recognized then, what, Deborah? The monolith. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's black, it's angular, it's tall. It's not like all the boulders and gravel that in their previous knowledge, familiarity. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that brings me to the second point I wanted to make here. Let me share this. Um, in the, the spaceship, so this is a little less than halfway through the film, um, the, I guess the captain of the ship in the, in the computer was talking about the humans hibernating. And mm. 
just a brief recap of what hibernation is, and this is what a lot of animals do, is just a long-term long -term dormant state where your metabolism slows and temperature drops precipitously. Well, yeah, and not necessarily, but one of those two, two things usually happens. And so it brings about like bears, you know, colloquially we know them uh, to be these hibernators, but they're a lot different than animals uh, that, what's the word? I think it's called like obligatory hibernation. Um, but the main difference is bears, their internal body temperature doesn't even drop that much. It's only like a few degrees Celsius. Uh, let me find where that article I read is. It's, so can uh, they wake up easily if threatened in their cave? Ooh, look at this. This is Pangea. Yeah. Yeah. Continental drift. <laughs> right. So yeah, they have a lot of tabs open. I'm going to try to navigate through here. Uh, <laughs> Let me see, where is it? Hibernation, okay. Obligate, obligate hibernation. So there, there are two types. There's one hibernation where you just hibernate no matter what every year or something called facultive hibernation where you hibernate because it acts to your advantage. And so if you're like starving or you're freezing, it's probably a good idea to hibernate. So you have that option, but um, hedgehogs and rodents, um, a lot of them just hibernate no matter what. And but squirrels like- from surgery. <laughs> so yeah, let me show you the clip where they mentioned hibernation. Uh, where is it? Okay. There was frost on their uh, facial windows. Right, exactly. And it, you, I don't know about hibernation. You read about it, but I don't think you'd want frost. Interesting meal that he has there. It's just like mushed up. Yeah, why did uh, do they have a replicator? Where are the meals made? You know, uh, and why do they have to be mush? Yeah. So you do these chambers now. Yeah. See, the, your heart stops uh, at super cold, so you'd need to have an electrical stimulus there. And you don't want to be so cold that you've got frosty windows. But there is an iPad. So this is all human hibernation. Yeah. Yeah. So here they say they breathe once a minute and their heart beats three times a minute. And I'm trying to hear this one more time. I think he says their body temperature drops by three degrees centigrade, not two, three degrees centigrade, because otherwise you're pretty much freezing. Freezing. No, it's interesting because you have to match the science of what we knew in 1967, 68 with what they're portraying in the film as the portrayal. Right. Yeah, and that's like, um, something we'll go into in the next slide, just uh, how little we knew about the universe, just our solar system back in the 60s. Although we had landed on the moon by then, 1969, which is the year that came out. Well, the movie um, came out the year before, I think, in 68. Oh, it did? Well, the, yeah, it came out- it came out before the moon landed. We oh, I see, it's the same year, but different month. We had been yeah. orbiting the moon. I gotcha. Right. Um, but we had not sent out like probes past the Jupiter, Saturn, and the rest. <clears throat> so we'll get to that in a minute. But so I don't 
think he says how much their temperature drops by. So what I hear him say is body temperature is down to about three degrees centigrade, which means yeah. they're pretty much frozen. And that is really surprising because that would mean the body you know, temperature just is dropping a, by 30 degrees Celsius. At you're least. Just above, you wouldn't want to freeze. Um, so you're just above freezing. Uh, because which is of course zero for water, uh, but a lot of the water is it uh, is solution, so that raises the freezing point anyway. Um, but you don't want frost crystals in the cells in your body. Um, but a lot of other things uh, really don't work, like your heart. Um, yeah. Uh, you don't want to do cardiac arrest unless you, there are pacemakers or, or something else in that little cocoon there. So when it comes to the drop in temperature, my understanding is the smaller animals have the really dramatic drop in temperature where the large primates like bears their temperature only drops by a few degrees. Mm. And so here it says like bears, it, there's been an argument whether they truly hibernate or not because their body temperature only drops at the most five degrees Celsius. And other hibernators, they drop over 30 degrees. And so it looks like the movie is trying mm. to mimic like that of a uh, hedgehog or something. And humans are a lot different than hedgehogs. Yeah. So I don't think we're going to have the same sort of hibernation mode. But it's interesting. I wonder um, if we'll ever be able to extend human life by uh, cryotherms. Mm. Mm. It's happened well, yeah. in certain injuries. It's happened in certain um, hypothermic conditions that don't oh, I see. in death. Um, so it is interesting that it, it's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Kids, kids come back from uh, a hypothermic episode better than <laughs> adults. Now is. I'm kind of unfamiliar with it. Are these hypothermic episodes like similar to a coma state? Well, yeah, you're in a coma state because your heart isn't pumping, so you're not getting any blood besides that your brain is frozen, is cold. Um, you know, but a kid falls through the ice at, uh, and is hypothermic and not non-responsive is still more likely to have a good outcome. It's not, you know, nothing. I don't. It's not great, and I don't know the numbers. But uh, a kid's likely to have a better uh, outcome than an adult. Uh, there certainly are medical situations where we put them in uh, a cryo uh, with heart attacks. And um, I don't know what else. I'm not that in on top of it. Stuart O'Ann? I don't know. Uh, I'm as on top of it as you are in terms of using ice baths and um, <clears throat> things like that, even in emergency rooms. Right, or ECMO. Yeah. There's another thing called torpor, which is not... Torpor. Torpor, yeah, which is not quite hibernation, torpor. but it's yeah. a state of decreased physiological activity. So it's being very sedentary, um, just about sleeping, only you're not, I don't think you're unconscious. Let me try to read about this. Yeah. I think this could be. It's your average after dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after Thanksgiving. Does yeah. one get one's heart rate down in that state? Yeah, you're um, probably pretty parasympathetic. You know? 
I don't think it has anything to do with the heart rate, actually. Uh, it's heart it's, doesn't, it's, heart isn't even mentioned in this article. So birds do this. Chickadees and hummingbirds. Do they do this like in the winter or any particular setting? Yeah. Um, in the whether like so in the winter time, there are some places where you get very little sunlight for six months. And so it would be mm -hmm. optimal to just not be uh, doing any physical activity. You conserve your energy for the days that you're not going to see much daylight. So I think this would be really useful for birds if they don't get a lot of sunshine. So yeah, winter, uh, winter time would probably be a good time to do that, a torpor. Um, interesting fact, and this is why I have the snail on the slide, is that some snails can sleep for up to three years. Mm. So that is super long-term mm. uh, hibernation. Mm. So it's not just, it's not just mammals. Um, bees hibernate also so there's some insects that hibernate um and then what do you call a snail is that a mollusk i guess if it has a shell yeah yeah <laughs> okay and then last thing i wanted to get to was before you go there just fact uh, yeah. check the movie came out 15 months before the moon landing it did. Okay. Good to know. Came out in April of 68. Nice. Okay, <clears throat> um, so the plot of the movie here was to fly to Jupiter. And I'm going to play this clip for you guys. This is sort of the spaceship en route to the planet. And so, after some pretty crazy things going on. So uh, plot question. Did, yeah. They, did they decide to go to Jupiter because of something the two monoliths signaled? You know, when they, when they could um, see each other, so to speak. You know, and the other one was, a, was going to Jupiter a, a result of the monolith thing. Yes, it was because they got a radio signal from the monolith and right. it was going to Jupiter. Okay. So here we go. Share this. Well, the little moon. You can just barely see the monolith oh. floating. I missed that in the moon. Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot, yeah. So is the monolith, are these beings? Is this, is the monolith a sentient being? I don't think so, but it, it is capable of producing signals. Mm -hmm. it's, this, it's this very esoteric thing. Um, uh, I saw it, I watched it on Amazon. Did you guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there was a quote from Arthur C. Clarke that if you understand the movie, we, he and Kubrick have failed. Mm -hmm. 
Now, what's really bizarre is that you have this flyover um, over these false colored terrains. Is and my best guess is like Jupiter. Yeah, I think this is supposed to be them it flying over Jupiter. Um, so but clearly, if like you're familiar, this is Earth landscaped. Mm -hmm. It's just Earth's landscape with false color. So did they not know that Jupiter was a gas giant? Right. So that's yeah, I thought this was already when he was flying into, like going through a black hole into the, the monolith is we're going through a wormhole. And uh -huh, yeah. All, all that was part of the uh -huh. next experience. Yeah, I think he ends up going through this, you know, alternate dimension. Mm -hmm. um, but reading through it, I believe he was on his way to landing on Jupiter. And that's why you see that, that terrain he's flying over. Mm -hmm. And Deborah, yes, I don't think back then they knew much about Jupiter's composition or what the surface looked like. And so it turns out now we know that Jupiter probably does not have a surface that looks anything like Earth or the rest of the terrestrial planets. And here we have a schematic of what it would look like if you cut open Jupiter and took out a slice. Most of all this white stuff on the outside is just hydrogen and helium, the lightest gases, the lightest elements in the universe. But Jupiter is so massive that you don't need to go very far for the pressure of that gas to build to such extreme conditions that you get crushed and melted just by hydrogen and helium. It's enough to just destroy your spacecraft entirely. Hmm. Not to mention the ferocious winds that you'd probably encounter because Jupiter is spinning out, spinning around super quickly. I think a day on Jupiter is only about 10 hours. And you think about it, Jupiter is oh. a thousand times the size of Earth. You can fit a thousand Earths inside of it. If it's going around in only 10 hours, it's you probably experience winds up to, I don't know, 500, 800 miles an hour at the least. Hmm. So there's the metallic hydrogen. We didn't, are you the one that mentioned that? Yeah, so I, I did yeah, mention that yeah. last week, which yeah. is this really exotic material. Um, we have never been able to replicate it. And we don't know even what it looks like, what it should look like. And that's why it's colored pink. <laughs> like, we don't know what metallic hydrogen really is. And you go beyond that, and we think there may be a rock or an ice core. And the way we figure out all these layers is first we do spectroscopy. So you can take images of Jupiter and using, you know, the emission spectra for different gases, you can tell, okay, there's definitely hydrogen in its atmosphere. There's definitely helium in its atmosphere. And we know the relative densities of, of both. And we take into account how big the planet is. And then we get a rough idea of the, um, the ratios. Um, and so it's like, okay, it's got to be this massive because we just um, figuring out using Newton's and Kepler's laws. Okay, if the moons are going around in such an orbit and it takes this long to go around the sun, just using gravity, we can find out the mass of Jupiter and we know how big it is. We get the relative densities of all the materials that make up the planet. Huh. Hmm.
what would it be like if we were to get something, an object to strike the metallic mantle, the metallic hydrogen mantle or the rock and ice core? Let's say you cleverly constructed a capsule that was able to penetrate through the atmosphere. It wasn't going to get crushed. And somehow it, it reached the bottom, it hit that metallic hydrogen. What would it even look like? So I'm, th I'm thinking about what may, it must take a lot of pressure versus temperature to create that metallic hydrogen. Because just, I don't know, intuitively I would think that the deeper in you go, the hotter it is, because there's so much um, pressure. pressure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's true. Um, but you say you do get warmer, however, I wouldn't, totally consider it to be warm. Um, I think the average temperature on Jupiter is something like 200 below zero. Mm. But we're talking about the zero, right? Yeah, so, okay. Negative 234 Fahrenheit. On the surface. Um, in the clouds, because we don't really have a defined surface. Yeah, the, near the planet center is much, much hotter. The core temperature could be 24,000. So maybe what's in, uh, as you get closer into the core, maybe it's melted stuff like, like our core. Yeah. Would you um, say 20? I saw 6,100 degrees Fahrenheit at the core. Where did you see? Well, well, look at the, look at your screen. Yeah. Ryan pulled up uh, um, Jupiter temperatures. I don't see that on my screen. I just see that picture of. That's one of one of four. Yeah, wait, let's see. All right. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I was looking at wrong. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, I see it. Forty three thousand. Pretty cool. Pretty pretty yeah. hot down there. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is much hotter than I expected, actually. And I think it, but I think it makes sense because, in a way, Jupiter almost was a star. If it was a little bit more massive, pressure would have been great enough to start fusing um, hydrogen into helium. Mm. So, what's mm. the temperature of the Earth's core? Um, I think it's a few thousand degrees, maybe 5,000 Fahrenheit. Let's see. Not much. Oh, 10,000, 10,000 Fahrenheit. Hmm. Range, oh, the range is somewhere between 8,000 and 10,000 Fahrenheit. So pretty scorching hot. <laughs> I mean, hmm. Think about it, 10,000 Fahrenheit, I think is the surface of the sun. And they do it in Kelvin, of course. Yeah. Yeah, 10,000 Fahrenheit. It's interesting how they got so precise, 941 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. That's interesting. Then it gets hotter the further away you get for a while. That's so interesting. But here's something crazy. This is ridiculous. The core of the sun in Fahrenheit, 27 million degrees. Yeah. How hot. do they know that? I think doing a lot of calculations with E equals MC squared, because okay. we know, I actually don't know which, 
which we found out first, if we found out the temperature first or we found out that the sun's powered by fusion? I don't remember. That's a good question. How do we know that? Because I, I'm not going to give you the correct answer on my first shot, I don't think. It's okay. The question alone is good. And the lentil soup recipe is intriguing. <laughs> How to... Uh, How to catch a leprechaun. That's the day. <laughs> that's, that's the most popular thing today. Oh. Oh, so, okay. That's right. We match it to a spectrum. Got it. We match it because we know the sun is yellow, yellowish green. Uh, so it should be medium hot. Hotter stars are bluer than the sun. Cooler stars are redder. But um, yeah, the movie 2001 Space Odyssey would have no idea what Jupiter looked like because uh, the first probe that visited Jupiter, I think was Cassini in the late seventies. Right. Um, let's see, I don't, let's see. I thought right? it was early seventies. Pioneer early. 10, 1973. Okay, 73, okay. Then close, hmm. yeah. Because Cassini was until uh, 2000. It wasn't until 30 years later. Yeah, so, so there, it's, there's a new probe coming in uh, that the Europeans are sending up in 2022, and it's called JUICE. JUICE. Yeah. And it's, the acronym is first two letters, Jupiter. And then the last three, ICE, it's uh, it's to explore the the ice moons, you know, um, the Galilean moons. Oh wow, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How long does it take to get there? <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. We talked about that, that last change. week with with uh, Dragonfly going to Titan on Saturn. It's nine years. Yeah. I wonder if like spacecrafts are picking up speed by any chance, like and by how much if they are. Mm -hmm. I think the fastest we've sent out a probe is like 15 or so thousand miles an hour. Wonder if we could even top that. Hmm. So what did you, I have a question. I have- Go ahead, yeah macro questions about the movie mm -hmm. um because Stuart, i know you have a patient in five minutes or so what um what was the relationship between hal and david uh, was that set up ahead of time or did that evolve over the movie so the computer and David? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Or, or is this uh, the harbinger of danger with AI? Yeah. And it's interesting to think about them um, even conceptualizing AI back in, ninth, in the 60s. You know, yeah. 65 to 68. Yeah, we were punching Fortran cars. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think their relationship started um, on their way to Jupiter um, since it was sort of Hal was like commanding the ship. It was like the computer responsible for getting them there. And mm -hmm. so David needed to have a strong communication with, with Hal. He was dependent on him. Yeah. Yeah. But when Hal said you had to change whatever the thing is, looked like a radar dish um, because it will fail in three days. That it, Hal said that when he was giving a psychological fitness test to David, and I was thinking, was this part of the test to see if he'd cooperate, to see 
you know, how, uh, how we would utilize this information. But I don't know, what do you think? Hmm. Um, let's see. Well, I think it was, then, you know, th it, this was really a concern that AI would take over, you know, the existential threat to humanity deal. Yeah. And basically it did, you know, it decided somehow that it was going to, uh, that it needed to kill all five humans to complete the mission with whatever thought power it had. Mm -hmm. You know, you yeah. Can, and the thing is like emotional stability, I think is a key part where like the humans may act emotionally in a lot of different circumstances. I think the movie developed AI to be like only rational and acting on, um, how do I say this? Uh, just like completely rationally, only, only using logic sort of like a computer. I'm trying to think of the word. Uh. So, well, you know, one of the fears that AI might, you know, take over and be an existential threat to humanity is, what if AI goes on auto drive and decides to take everything that's there and make it into paper clips, include everything on the planet, including human beings? It's not, emotionally driven to kill us, but it's just doing its mission, you know? Or if we're ants, you know, when we have ants in the house, we, we don't dislike ants, we just don't like them. Hey. They're very annoying. Yeah. But, but on the other hand, this AI concept, and has that been directly explored with uh, Kubrick and uh, AC Clark? Uh, that AI was even on their mind for the future or that computers could think for themselves. They certainly make the computer into a character in the movie who has, um, uh, there, was, there seemed to be like a power struggle between uh, Hal and David mm. um, because David was dependent on Hal and then Hal, um, Kind of reminds David when he goes out in the bubble to get his friend, um, you know, why didn't you put your helmet on? <laughs> you can't get in that way uh, if you do it. But then suddenly he has a helmet. What'd you say? Then suddenly he has a helmet. Well, he didn't get the helmet until he actually got into the ship, apparently. Right. Oh. He didn't had one in the ship. He got into the ship. He got into I'm going to go. I'll let you guys finish. Okay. Too little All right. short. He got into the helmet, into the helmet once he got in the ship, but he got into the ship yeah. and he said, it's going to, you know, Hal says, it's going to be difficult, David, you're going to have trouble. And he did. I mean, it was, it was very, it was, I thought I saw this power struggle between the computer and the, uh, and, and David. And um, I figured, okay, we're talking about a 19, late 60s, um, you know, sociological understanding of computers um, storyline here. Um, and then I thought, how would they do that today? That was my big question. Mm -hmm. How would that be different today, given our understanding not only of space, um, the overall, a uh, big theme with the monolith and man from the beginning to the end uh, was most interesting and probably very universal. Um, but the portrayal of the computer and the man struggle was fascinating. So Ryan, do you think that the computer was always um, taking the logic, the logical next step from the information he just gleaned. Um, I would think so, yeah. Um, so, 
like like the machine is more robotic than human in that regard. The other thing I was considering when it comes to just AI in general is that humans will always be the ones developing AI. Yeah. It's not like artificial intelligence is going about making its own artificial intelligence. It always has to come back to us. We are always the creators. And if that's the case, um, we have to ask the humans, like, what is, how is the AI supposed to behave? Like, what's the sociopathic are you? Yeah. Yeah. I have a question because. I think this is those grappled in the movie AI. You know, there was a movie AI. Mm. And um, there are speculations of AI going out of control based on mathematical, logical principles. And then there's always this um, portrayal or interface with. Um, you know, an, an emotional impact on humans. Hmm. I mean, I but, think it's. Oh, uh, oh. What'd you say, Deborah? I was, I was, I was thinking about how logical consistency. Um, that the scene that I alluded to before, where. Uh, computer says that this this piece of equipment out on the outside of the ship is going to fail in three days with no warning. And then when they talk back to Earth, Earth says uh, that's, as I remember it, that um, our mirror computer does not say that and maybe Hal just has a glitch in his um, system, but that that um, what it whatever it is, you know, was it a command or was it a perception that this thing's going to fail? What was that came out of nowhere? Whereas everything else, maybe it proceed, you know, went from logic. He could read their lips that they were going to turn them off, so he turned them off, you know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, everything else may be logic, but that came out of nowhere. So, yeah, it's interesting to see, like, just in our future, with our dynamical beef with AI. Um, already, we have um, interactions with AI pretty regularly. People who have like Alexa in their house or Siri on their phone. Yeah. So it's like we talk to these beings as real humans and a lot of people like treat them like real humans um even like your gps when it reads you directions you really feel like you're interacting with another, with another person so and then there's, then there's the um was it on saturday night live where they portrayed alexa as a marital therapist <laughs> <laughs> i didn't see that that sounds funny oh it's a riot <laughs> i mean it's First of all, uh, we got to be careful because you have to look at whether or not um, China has the bandwidth, the database, and the information to be five steps ahead of us on all of those topics. But, um, you know, it, we think of it as it's only as capable as humans can think. It's only as capable. Well, humans can make algorithms that are seemingly thinking beyond what we would normally be thinking. Yeah. You know, and it's very, I mean, this, this movie raises that question decades ahead of when we've actually been dealing with the actual issue in detail. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, that's all I have for um, <clears throat> today's sci-fi explained. Is there any other questions or topics you wanted to address for tonight? Well, well, I never understood, you know, what happens 
to David and then suddenly he's star baby. And I mean, what, what is that? I, <laughs> oh, I had a really oh, hard time at following. The very end? Yeah. At the very end, that part, that was a 1968 leap, I thought, but I didn't, I didn't get with a that. Lot of, with a lot of hate Ashbury thrown in. Perhaps. You know, you could tell that because when he was going through the wormhole and sailing over the landscape with the funny colors and everything, they'd all of a sudden shine up on, on some kind of eyeball. <laughs> and they'd yeah, yeah, yeah. On some yeah. weird ex facial expression. And I thought, that is so 60s. <laughs> <laughs> that is so 60s. And then um, on the other hand, the whole circle with him um you know coming into this house which was very neo way too neoclassic um you look at his face in the uh helmet and it's wrinkled <laughs> yeah and he goes it's from that wrinkled wrinkled. face to yeah. um what looked like one of my 93 year old friends on his deathbed um ball well, he he looked like um uh, what's his name from Contact? But he, he you know, he's bald. He's no. old. He's uh, Armin Hammer. What'd you say? Yeah. Well, it was meant to in Contact. It was meant to portray Armin Hammer. So I don't remember the character's name. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, John Hurt. So why yeah. did the monolith reappear? I think it was the same. Yeah, it's the same monolith. I don't know how it really got from. Earth to orbiting Jupiter. Yeah, um, maybe it's a population of, of monoliths. It could be, yeah. It may be, it may be multiple mo monoliths. I that have reappeared that. this year in the middle of freaking nowhere. Yeah, yeah, Utah. <laughs> of all places. And in the Middle East somewhere. Yeah. Turkey? I can't remember. Someone's so, playing with our minds. Yeah board with too much money and time yeah so what would we have some more movies lined up there ryan um yes i just need to come up with a list and i'm going to update the the website i'll probably end up doing that today i'm sorry tomorrow or friday i'll put the the new list on on our website it, this was so interesting having seen the movie back in 1968 and having dealt with the um, uh, Ricard and Johann Strauss pieces of music in many, many ways. Um, he does not use the rest of the Ricard Strauss, also struck Zarathustra, because it's very complex. And the simplicity of the Johann Strauss march is an interesting juxtaposition. Don't you think, Deborah? Well, I don't know about music the way you do, my dear. So, yeah. But I'm I, just, it was like closing a gap. I mean, I wouldn't have, uh, to be able to see it again and then discuss it was, and yeah. think about it while I was seeing it in order to discuss it was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sure thing. So do you know what, at least what the movie might be for next week so we can start off? Um, I haven't, to be honest, I haven't picked one out yet. Okay. Can I, I will email that to you probably tomorrow when I figure it out. So I'll give you a chance to watch it. And That's then, uh, okay. I'm busy watching Irish films tonight. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. Take care, Lindsay. It was nice talking with you. <laughs> hey, yeah, uh, sorry. I'm actually at work, so I'm not able to be 100% here, but I have appreciated uh, the conversation so far. And well, maybe I can join so, you a little more. Later. Look at your, your logo is like a United Nations logo. Yeah, I run Interconnections 21, uh, so it's the nonprofit here that puts on the Model UN conference. Oh, and, uh, congratulations on the Model UN uh, results. 
Thank yeah. you. Yeah. The students yeah. did amazing. Really, really yeah. cool that they're still crushing it in the virtual format. So, yes. um, yeah. but yeah, my phone gets a little confused when I do Zoom on my phone. It, it goes to my work Zoom instead of my personal Zoom. So, <laughs> sorry, I wasn't trying to represent that, but I'm at, a I'm at a no, different no, right yeah. now. <laughs> it's just interesting. It's yeah. great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the Model UN kids did well and um, they've always done well. And I appreciate this organization. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Appreciate that as well. We're going to be getting ready for our uh, conference uh, in Tijuana County in November, but we start working on it in a couple of weeks. So hopefully we'll be in person this year. We went virtual last year. It was gnarly, but hopefully we'll be able to be back in person this November. Well, speech and debate was like that as well. Yep. Take yep. For sure. Join us again, please. Thank you. Yes. See you all next week, hopefully. Yes. <laughs> Bye, Ryan. Bye. Take care. Bye, Ryan. Good, good evening.